All right, so we are in chapter one, section 10, called Roots and Zeros. This is for integrated math two, or I am two. Uh, so I'm just gonna go over a few of the features on the screen here. Um, when you first open a homework assignment, this is what it will look like, uh, if, with the exception of two pieces. You will see a due date on your screen. The teacher preview does not give me a due date. Um, the second piece here um, that you will see is attempts. Um, this is on both screens. Um, so you, I'm on attempt one of unlimited attempts. This means I can submit this assignment as many times as I would like. It doesn't affect what you've turned in or what you've gotten, you know, correct or incorrect. It, it will let keep all of your problems the same every time you come in. As far as um, correct, it does change the problem um, the actual problems themselves change, like the numbers. Um, this shows me there's nine questions on this assignment, which, um, you know, just depends on the assignments here. They go anywhere from one to ten questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Grading policy is always the best score, so whichever attempt is your best one is the one you get to keep. And partial credit is always enabled, meaning, you know, if you answer one of nine questions, you get credit for the one question. Um, this piece has to do with homework submission. So once you click start, you always want to finish your work. And what that means is once I click start here, this is the second piece that will only be on the student side, is you want to ident or, um, look down at the bottom right corner here, you will see submit assignment. So no matter what, when you want to leave this screen, when you're all done, or even if you're not all done and you're just taking a break, you want to click submit assignment. Because you have unlimited attempts. I can keep coming back in and try this over and over and over again. Okay. It's not going to take anything away as far as, you know, if, if you were, you know, over here on problem five and you already had one through four answered correctly, it's not going to make you do those over again. You get to keep those. Clicking the submit button simply lets us know that you have um, tried your first attempt or whichever attempt it is. And we can see um, how much is... Um, how, how many you've gotten cracked, how many you've tried, you know, we get some information there. It also stops the program from locking you out of all of your other assignments because that's what's going to happen if you just leave the screen. If you, you know, X off the window or you go back to the home button um, and you don't click that submit assignment button, everything else will be locked until you come back and click that submit assignment button. So just good habit, always click it. We have three tools on the side here, very important. Explanation will explain this exact problem to us. So it's going to give us the solution and the answer. That's why we're gonna lose the question attempt. It's not gonna give you the answer and then let you come type it in. So it's gonna give you the red X, you'll have to click submit assignment button and then click quick retake to come back in and try an actual problem. Example gives you a general example of what you're working on. Um, and it, it'll show you kind of exactly what it wants us to do. So this is what we're gonna try out here. We're gonna do some long division with some polynomials. So, um, and I think we're gonna get a couple of different methods here to do this. So I'll, I'll show you how we walk through this piece. Um, but this is just a general example and you can click on this multiple times. It'll give you a different example each time. And you can also message your teacher right from here if you have any um, questions or if you, you know, you're stuck on a problem It'll attach the question that you're on when you click message. So we know exactly where to come back and help you. All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. So as you saw in the example, we're gonna do some long division with some polynomials. And there are multiple methods for this one, but we're gonna start with this long division method and we'll see where they move us to throughout this assignment here. So when we're doing long division with polynomials, what we wanna do is we always want us to figure out what do I need to multiply this first piece by, this x, to make it match what, what's in the first position here. So I'm gonna have to multiply by two because I want it to be a two, and I'm gonna have to multiply by x. So that it, it when I multiply x and two x, it becomes two x squared. And then I also have to multiply that by four. So four times two x is eight and I'm gonna draw a line and subtract, just like I would in regular division. The 13 is gonna come down, and then 12x minus 8x, that gives me 4x. 2x, minus, 2x squared minus 2x squared, those cancel out. That's kinda of what I wanted to happen there. 
All right, so now this piece is my new first term because it, it brought down. Um, so now to multiply x and to get it to be 4x, all I'd have to do is multiply by positive 4. Oop, close that. So 4 times x is 4x, and 4 times 4 is 16. And I'm going to subtract. Um, so 13 minus 16. Um, and remember, I know it says plus here. It's a positive 16, but I'm subtracting these like I would in regular division. So 13 minus 16 is negative 3. 4x minus 4x cancels out again, which is what we wanted to happen. So now we've gotten down to, th to negative 3. There's nothing I can multiply x by to get it to just be negative 3. This is called a remainder. Okay? So this is my what's left over. So my quotient is going to be 2x plus 4, the piece we have on the top here. And my remainder is negative 3. All righty. So that is a, our first practice in long division with some polynomials. Okay. We are going to take a look at some factors here. Um, so it actually gives me equals 0 at the end, and it says solve for you. So I, I have some, some more factoring I need to do. I know they factored some of it here, but we definitely have some more factoring to do before we can set these equal to 0 and see where, where our solutions are going to be. So with this one, you can factor out the 3 if you want to, but it will actually kind of factor out itself. But we can go and factor out 3. I can divide by 3 here, and I can say it's u plus 15, because 3 u divided by 3 is u. 15 divided by, oops, I wrote 15, silly me. 15 divided by 3 is 5, like that. Again, I did that funny little mark there. So I can factor that 3 out if I would like, but... That's not a huge deal because that would have factored itself out, um, kind of, when we got to the end, um, when we set them equal to zero. So with these ones, I do want to go through and factor this. So I'm going to have two pieces here. The only way to get u squared is u and u. I have a minus and I have a minus. That's telling me I'm going to have a plus and a minus in here because that's the only way I have positive times a negative. And since it's a negative in the middle here, my bigger number is going to be in the negative position. So I'm going to have 1 and 4. Sorry, I'm, I'm finding the factors of 4. I should probably write this like I've been doing. 1 and 4 and 2 and 2. Those are my only two factors of 4. Well, I need them to subtract to get to 3. So that's going to be 1 and 4. And remember, my bigger number needs to be negative. That way it becomes negative 3 when I subtract. Negative 4 plus 1, that gives me negative 3. All right, and this equals 0. So now this guy is ready to solve. Really, this 3 just kind of disappears. We just ignore it. We have u plus 5 equals 0. u plus 1 equals 0. And u minus 4 equals 0. So I'm going to solve all three of these. I have minus 5 on both sides. So u equals negative 5. I'm going to have minus 1 on both sides for the second one. So u equals negative 1. And I'm going to add 4 to both sides for this last one. And I'm going to have a u equals positive 4. So I was anticipating three solutions. Um, and the reason I was anticipating three solutions is I have two here and I have another one here. So even though I don't see u cubed, if I were to multiply these all back together, I would see u cubed once these were multiplied. Um, so it's just one of those things you, you can kind of look ahead on that if you recognize how to um, or, or learn how to identify those pieces. It makes it a little easier. So we're just going to separate these with commas. And there are our four solutions, or three solutions. Continue. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and switch to blue for whatever reason. It's just a little less mean here. x squared plus 13x plus 30. So it says find all the zeros of the quadratic function. So first, we're going to factor 
But when it says find the zeros, what it means is when is x zero? Where is the x-intercept? Well, in order to find the x-intercept, I make y zero. In order for the, for to find the y-intercept, you make x zero. So it's, it's one of those things that we learned kind of back in chapter one. Um, I want to say that was, that might have even been an I am one, actually, when we were doing that. Um, so I'm going to make y zero. I'm just going to go ahead and do it ahead of time. And I'm going to factor these pieces. So the only way to get x squared is x times x. These are both positive, so I know I'm adding. And all I have to do is break apart 30 to figure out, okay, what's what factor of 30 adds up to 13? So 1 and 30, nope, that won't do it. 2 and 15, those would subtract to 30, but we're not subtracting. Let's see, 3 and 10, oop, that works. So 3 and 10. And once I find the factor that adds up, I can stop. Most likely, there would not be another one. So I can go ahead and, and um, take a break on that as far as factoring and, and go ahead and focus on the problem now. So now that I have it factored, I can set both of them equal to zero, just like I did on that last one. And I just need to solve. So minus 3, minus 3. These guys cancel, and I have negative 3. And minus 10, minus 10 x, these guys cancel, and I get negative 10. So there are my two factors, and again, I was anticipating 2 because of that square. So that definitely lets me know there that kind of identifies how many I should be looking for. So we have negative 3 and negative 10. Check. All right. Checking along here. A couple more. Okay, so now we can see this in function notation. So that's what this is. This f of x is just function notation. And it says, find all real zeros of the function. Remember, when I want the zeros, that means make y zero. And f of x, or the function notation, is just another way to write y. So instead of writing f of x, I, can, I could write y if I wanted to. But remember, I want to know when this is zero. So I'm just going to go ahead and write it as zero on my page here. Squared and x minus 6 squared. So they have factored this all the way down. There's nothing left to factor here. Um, so what we want to do is go ahead and set each one equal to 0 and see what we get. And there are two of them here, but they would both be the same equation, right? We don't need to actually write them twice in this situation. So now I'm going to divide by 2 on both sides because I want to get rid of that 2. x equals 0 because 0 divided by 2 is 0. Plus 4, plus 4. So now I have x equals positive 4 and then plus 6, plus 6. And x equals 6. All right, and I don't believe they're going to make us put in our doubles, but I'm going to go ahead and try it here. Because I don't see anything that identifies double roots, so they might make us type in the double roots. And what I mean by that is, technically, we have x minus 4 twice. We have x minus 6 twice. So this is a double root. There would be two of them. Double root. And this one also would be a double root. So both of these are doubles. So let's see what it says here. Okay, so it gave it to us there. Um, normally, they would not make you type it in twice. That's why I didn't think they were going to make us do it. But it also doesn't have us identifying double roots either. So um, sometimes they, they will actually have you mark 4 as a double root and 6 as a double root. Um, all right. Number 5. Oop. I wanted my eraser. Okay, so this is find a polynomial, f of x of degree 4, that has the following zeros. So now we've been getting the zeros. Now we're starting with zeros. So remember, this is x equals 5, x equals 0, x equals negative 4, and x equals negative 1, like that. Um, so, and... What we want to do is we want to go backwards, and I'm going to look at the explanation here just because I think that'll be a little easier to show you on this one. So they're, they're doing three zeros, and they have the same thing I have, but what they're doing is they're, they're 
going back and they're setting them equal to zero. Um, so we want to subtract 5 from both sides here. So I have x minus 5 equals 0. So now we're back to a binomial. x minus 0 would equal 0, so this one would just stay 0. We would add 4 to both sides here. So I'd have x plus 4 equals 0, because those guys cancel, right? That's why they become 0. And then add 1 to both sides. So we'd have x equals, oops, plus 1 equals 0. So now we have some pieces here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put them back together, just like this. So we rebuilt the binomials, and then we're going to multiply them back together. Um, so I have x minus 5, x plus 4, and x minus, or plus 1. And I want to make sure I put this x on there. It's just x on the beginning. And then that's going to equal f of x which they already have here. So I'm going to put it on the end here because I don't have enough room to write on the other side. It doesn't matter if it's on the left side or the right side. It means the same thing. So we get to type this guy in here. We have x and x minus 5, x plus 4, x plus 1. All right. Oop, I forgot one of my parentheses there. Okay, so this should be good to go there. Yay! So this is kind of going backwards from when we had zeros. So just remember, you, these, this is what x equals for each one. And you go back to the binomial, and then you put it back, multiplying together. So we're literally working backwards from what we've been doing this whole time. Okay, use the rational zeros theorem to list all possible zeros of the following. So if you don't know what the rational zeros theorem is, you're definitely going to want to hit example there so that it explains it to us because that's definitely going to be a little bit more difficult if we don't understand. Um, so if we look at this, the rational zeros theorem can be stated as follows. Let g of x equal, and we have this kind of longer equation here, where we can see that it's the nth term, the nth term minus 1. We have a, a, a variable with n, and it's the same term. We have the variable with um, the nth term minus 1. Um, and it goes on and on until we get down to 0 here. Um, a polynomial with integer coefficients and the first term cannot be 0. So if g of x has a rational 0, then the 0 could be written as p divided by q, where p is a factor of a, the last term, a to the 0, so that's um, the last term, and q is a factor of a, n. All right. In other words, the only possible possibilities for rational zeros of g of x are numbers of the form p, q, where p is a factor of a, 0, which is the last term, and q is a factor of a n. All right, so let's actually look at what this means because I think that's a little bit much reading it that way. So we must list all the possible zeros for this equation. And this isn't the nest, this isn't the one that we have on our attempt, but this is the example. So we have a to the zero or the, the zero term is three. It's just the, the last number, the, the regular constant number, which is three. And the first term or the first coefficient is negative five. So any rational zeros of g of x must have the following form. It must be p divided by q. So it's 3 divided by negative 5. So and it's a factor of 3 and a factor of 5. So then we go and we look. Okay, well, the factors of 3 are 1 and 3. The factors of negative 5 are 1 and 5. And then we go through and we create all the possibilities for these factors. And that's what we're listing. 1 divided by 1 is 1. 3 divided by 1 is 3, 1 divided by 5 is 1 fifth, and 3 divided by 5 is 3 fifths. So we literally just build them, so it's 1 over 1, 1 over 5, 3 over 1, 3 over 5. And these are all the possible factors of this um, quadratic. Well, this is more than a quadratic, because um, this has 
to the fourth power. So this isn't even a quadratic. It's going to have at four roots in it. These are the possibilities. These are not all of the roots. We're just finding the possibilities for the roots. So there's eight possibles. Um, but we can type it in as plus minus since they're giving us that option. Okay, so let's go ahead and practice that now that we've talked through all that. Because um, I know this one's a little bit... Um, a little bit confusing, um, you know, just to talk through. It's definitely a little easier I think, to actually see it done. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and erase this one that we were working on before. So I have a little bit more room here. So remember, it's... Um, and it's P divided by Q. I want to make sure I'm not mixing that up really quick. Yeah, P divided by Q. So P is the last term and Q is the first coefficient. So P divided by Q, and in this case, P, and it's going to be the factors of P. P is negative 2, and Q is negative 7. So the factors of negative 2 are plus or minus 1 and plus or minus 2, 1 times 2. The factors of 7 are going to be plus or minus 1, and plus or minus 7. All right, so now we're going to go through and we're going to build this, and we say 1 over 1, plus or minus, 1 over 7, plus or minus, 2 over 1, plus or minus, and 2 over 7, plus or minus. So now we have to reduce this a little bit because two div or 1 by div divided by 1 is 1, and this guy just stays 1 7. We don't want to turn it into a decimal. 2 divided by 1 is 2. And then plus or minus 2 over 7. All right. So we want to make sure that um, no value in your list appears more than 1. So we don't want to relist anything. But as long as we're doing this um, pattern, we should be able to get everything we need here. So we want to make sure we click plus or minus here on our toolbar there, and plus or minus, we have 1 over 7, plus or minus again, help if I hit comma, if I don't have a comma, that's not a separator, so it actually would mark me wrong there, because it doesn't understand that I have a separate term, so be careful about not hitting comma, okay, so and it doesn't matter that they're not in order from least to greatest, it shouldn't give me any grief about that, it should just be fine with that order. You should put them in order from least to greatest. That's actually a better way to do it, but I'm just listing them in the order I wrote them down here. All right. So there's also another rule here that we can use to figure out how many roots we're going to have. So we can use Descartes' rule of signs to determine the possible numbers of positives and negative um, real zeros. So this has to do with the changes in these negatives. So we're going to look at the example again really quick because this is definitely a little easier to explain from an example. Um, so in this one, we have a similar problem. I think this one's a little bit bigger than the one they're showing us on our screen, but that's okay. Um, so now if we look at the rule, the rule is the number of positive real zeros of P of X or the function of X um, is either equal to the number of variations in the sign, so every time it changes sign, we count that, or less than that num less than that by an even number. So if we have enough to subtract by an even number, we can. The number of negative real zeros is either equal to the number of variations of the sign of p of negative x, or less than that um, by an even number. So let's take a look at what this actually means. So for positive real, we have a negative to a positive, that's one change. We have a positive to a negative, that's another change. And then a negative to a positive, oh, that's another change. This last one, they don't have the, the jump here, there's no change on this one, it's positive to positive. So we don't count that one. So then they're saying that according to this rule, there could either be three or one positive real zeros. So it's either one or three. So. Um, the reason it's 1 or 3 is that 1 is less than this number we have here that we actually counted by 2. 
by an even number. Okay. All right. Now, if we do negatives, what we need to do is we need to um, take a look at all of the signs. So we're going to put a negative in here for the x. We need to be careful with this one because it doesn't actually make all of the x's negative. If I have a even um, exponent, the x is actually going to cancel, or the the exponent is actually going to cancel out the negative. So it's not going to change anything. But if it's an odd exponent, it is going to change the sign. So this negative 6x to the 4th stays negative 6x to the 4th. But positive 4x to the 3rd changes to negative 4x to the 3rd. This is an even, so this one's going to stay the same. But this is an um, odd, because 1 is odd, it's going to change. And that last one doesn't change at all. So now we have negative to negative, negative to negative, negative to negative. The only one that changes is negative to positive. So it's only one change. So that's the only possibility there. We can't subtract by two because that would you know, throw us into negative numbers and we don't want to do that. So then we just say it's either going to be three or one positive zeros or one negative zero. Um, and this just gives us the possibilities um, to identify our roots here. So let's go ahead and practice this. So first, I'm going to go ahead and write this down. Whoops, help if I change that. So negative 6x cubed plus 5x squared minus 4x minus 1. All right, so we have negative to positive. That's one change. Positive to negative, that's another change. And negative to negative, that's not a change. So for positive real roots, I'm going to have either 2 or 0 because I can subtract 2 from that and get 0. So I'm either going to have 2 positives or 0 of them. For negative, remember, I have to go through and I have to apply that negative sign in there. So if it's a odd exponent, it's going to change signs. But if it's an even exponent, it's going to stay the same. So this is an odd. That's going to change. And we go here. Oh, and I still have to put the exponents on there. All right, so we have positive to positive. There's no change. Positive to negative, there's one change. So there's only one possibility for a negative. All right, so that's just a couple of rules to help us identify our, our different types of roots without having to go through and actually factor the whole thing. We can identify what kinds of roots we're going to have right from the get-go. Um, so sometimes we do not have what we call real roots. We have imaginary roots. Um, which means it's the root, the, the equation was not on the x-axis at all. And that's when we get into irrational roots, or we get into ones that are not real. So um, it's not even irrational, actually. It's just not going to be real, because irrational is in the real numbers section. Um, so this is in the imaginary numbers. Uh, so we want to multiply these two pieces together. So I have... Um, x minus 2 plus 3i, and i is our imaginary number, but it's a very specific. What it means is i is equal to the square root of negative 1. We call that imaginary because technically there's no way to get that negative 1 square root because in order to have a, a square, it would have been a negative times a negative, so negative 1 times negative 1, which would get, get you positive 1, or positive 1 times positive 1, which would get you 1. So there really isn't any way for us to get that negative 1 under the square root sign the way it is. It's not possible. So instead of just saying, oh, not possible, we don't, we don't have this, we came up with this imaginary i, which represents the, this square root of negative 1, so that we can keep moving through certain types of problems. Um, all right, so we're going to reduce this a little bit, and I'm going to get rid of some of these parentheses. So I need to distribute this negative sign. It's the, the main thing here is negative 2 minus 3i and x, and I'm going to do the same thing here, minus 2 plus 3i, like that. Okay, so we want to go and we want to start multiplying. 
So I like to do this where I take this first one and I multiply it by everything. So I get x squared, and then I get x times negative 2 is negative 2x. And then for the last piece here, I get x times 3i, I get plus 3xi. And this is going to be a little bit longer, so I'm going to kind of piece it together here. Because um, normally we go this direction, but I don't believe I have any extra room over there. Um, to keep moving that direction. So, I'm going to just, um, instead of trying to write off to the side here, I'm just going to go ahead and write this one underneath. So it's going to be negative 2 times x. That would be negative 2x. Remember, that would be on the end here, so it's all kind of one long string. Then I'm going to multiply negative 2 times negative 2. That's going to give me positive 4 negative 2 times 3i, that's going to give me negative 6x, or 6i, not xi, just i. All right, and then I'm going to pick one last color here. I will do this in green. So I'm going to take three, negative 3i, and I'm going to multiply by each piece. So negative 3i times x is negative 3xi. Negative 3 times negative 2 it's positive 6i, and then negative 3i times 3i is going to be negative 9i squared. All right, so I've multiplied all of my pieces together. And by the way, a very quick way to know if you've multiplied every piece, if I have 3 here and 3 here, 3 times 3 is 9. I should have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 terms. I do have 9 terms, so we are happy with that. All right, so now I want to go through and I want to start combining like terms. I don't see any other x squared, so I'm going to go ahead and write x squared down here. I have negative 2x and negative 2x, so that's negative 4x, and let's see, I get the next one, I have positive 3xi, negative 3xi, well those cancel, one's positive, one's negative, and they're exactly the same. And then I have negative 6 and positive 6i. These guys cancel. Um, so I have plus 4 here. There's no other numbers. I do have negative 9i squared. So remember, if i is equal to the square root of negative 1, if I square this, so I have these two multiplied together like this, well, that means that I can take one of them out. So this... When I have i squared, what it means is negative 1. So I have x minus 4x plus 4, and this is actually 9 times negative 1, like that. So really, it's going to flip this sign, and it's going to make it positive 9, because negative 9 times negative 1 is positive 9. So now I have this like term here. So I can go 4x, and I can add these together, and I get 13. Um, so we just wanted to, um, express, note that the, these expressions contain complex numbers, simplify your answer as much as possible. So in this case, all of the imaginary I's disappeared. It could possibly be that you will have an I in your answer because it's there in the toolbox for you to grab. So it's there for a reason. I'm assuming that means that it will show up at some point. All right. So that one was definitely a bit more involved. That one took a little bit more doing to make sure we multiplied all these pieces correctly. Whoops. Dang it. Alrighty. We're going to find the polynomial f of x of degree 3 with real coefficients and the following zeros. So we have x equals negative 1. That's our first one. We also have x equals 3 minus i. When we have a, uh, an imaginary root like this, what we also have to do is it's conjugate. So we have to do 3 plus i, like that. So remember, we're going to add these over so we have our binomial there that is equal to 0. So I'm going to subtract 3, and I'm going to add i, subtract 3, add i to both sides. So I'm going to put x minus 3 
plus i equals zero and minus three minus i on both sides here. So I end up with x minus three minus i, and these are starting to look like j's a little bit, equals zero. So now I have x plus one, x minus three plus i, and x minus three minus i, like this, equals zero. So first, let's go ahead and multiply these two together because what's going to happen, because it was a plus and a minus, it's actually going to eliminate some of the pieces. So before we jump into this x plus 1, let's go ahead and do this other piece. So I'm going to color code this. So I'm going to go x times x is x squared. x times 3 is negative 3x. x times i is negative xi. And I'll go green for the next one. Negative 3 times x is negative 3x. Negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Negative 3 times negative i is positive 3i. We'll go pink for the last one here. i times x is positive xi. And then i times negative 3 is negative 3i i times negative i is negative i squared. Okay, so this is actually going to eliminate a few pieces here because all we have left, we have x squared, so I'm using that one, negative 3x and negative 3x, so that's negative 6x. With this one, we have negative xi, we have positive xi. These guys just cancel. We don't have to write anything down. We do have a plus 9 here, and then we have 3i and negative 3i, and the only piece with i we have left is i squared. So remember, i squared is negative 1. That's what that means. So this is actually plus 1 is what this means. So instead of 9, I'm going to have 9 plus 1, which is 10. Now I can go through and deal with this piece here. Um, so now we're going to multiply, and it still equals 0 on here. So we're going to have the same thing, I'm going to color code again. x times x squared is x cubed. x times negative 6 is negative 6x six squared. x times 10 is positive 10x. And then we're going to move to 1. 1 times x squared is x squared. And I'm even lining these up here. It's positive x squared. 1 times negative 6 is negative 6x, 1 times 10 is plus 10. So now I'm just going to add, I actually lined them up nice and, and neatly there, so I can kind of just add straight down, so x cubed, and then negative 6 plus 1, that's negative 5x squared, 10 minus 6, that's going to be 4x plus 10. So this is the equation that they want us to write out with a degree of 3. Minus 5x squared plus 4x. Oops, I forgot to hit over. Plus 4x plus 10. All right. So that was section 10. Some of that was, I know, a little bit more complicated on getting through. But, you know, definitely go through and watch the videos there. You can also use your resources to look things up on the Internet if you need to, um, you know, because sometimes there's other explanations that might make a little bit more sense there. So I hope that helped. I will see you in Chapter 2.